good evening everybody and good morning to dr ilavya as well as mr manoj barot who have joined from usa and a very warm welcome to the fourth international webinar on food service management and entrepreneurship which has been organized by the department of foods and nutrition and its and its alumni the faculty of family and community sciences the maharaja sayajira of university of baroda this webinar is jointly organized by enpran india project which is co-funded by the erasmus plus and the office of international affairs the maharaja sayajira of university of baroda at the outset let me first thank our patron professor parimal vyas the honorable vice chancellor of the maharaja sayajira of university of baroda for being a facilitator in organizing such events during the corona virus pandemic in fact let me bring to your notice that our university i welcome you and request you to deliver the opening remarks for this seminar good evening and thank you swati for this uh, introduction and welcoming everyone uh, at the outset i really want to congratulate this department it's really been active throughout the covid and this is the fourth one in the series and they still have two more to go so uh, congratulations to the department first for being so active right through in uh, and i know that there's a lot of other things also that uh, you know keep the department busy including their teachers because of the finishing their courses planning for examinations and there are a whole lot of other issues but in spite of that they have taken this uh, initiative and uh, my heartiest congratulations to the department they've always been in the forefront in our faculty and the faculty is extremely proud of this department so congratulations first of all to all of you and especially the head uh, professor minakshi mehan uh at the outset I, this is the fourth one now that we are having and today's uh, webinar the topic is on food service management i was especially happy to see this because uh, this department has also started a pg program in uh, a one year pg diploma in food service management so i'm sure this webinar could also be a kind of a um you know for promoting this particular course for all the participants who are there and i already see there are about 229 participants who are here and i'm sure there are many more on facebook who have joined in as uh, to view the and to hear this uh, webinar so uh, it should uh, give a kind of a boost to this program because it's just been started uh, i think 2 years back and uh, i think one year we have had uh, actually a year so uh, it's a new program and i think this would uh, help the program to take off in a bigger way so uh, without wasting any more time because i'm sure everybody wants to hear the and food service management is something that um, is really an upcoming field i know all of us through the covid have been sitting and practicing all our uh, you know uh, recipes and trying to become uh, good cooks at home and i'm sure once all this is over nobody is going to want to do it as much at home and i'm sure it'll you know this is the field that is going to really take off so uh, thank you and all the best once again to each one of you and thank you so much all the speakers all the alumni of our uh, faculty and to each one of you thank you for being there for the department and for the faculty and the university thank you all the best thank you thank you very much madam madam for your blessings i now request our head of the department professor minakshi mehan to give a brief overview of today's seminar thank you swati and i think thanks a lot to our dean because 
she she kind of understood a lot of things that i wanted to talk you know the whole idea behind all these webinars is because this is also our admission times to promote and to show because who well, who is a better promoter for us than our own alumni you know where the department students after studying can go so especially for this particular course i am very keen because we have not been able to popularize it as much as we would like it to happen you know other courses are doing very well but somehow we are not getting students for this course because people don't yeah for already putting in those words which i really want to put say and my presentation is going to be on that and we i must also thank you for giving us this idea of having webinars because it was you who had planned a webinar for your department opened it up for us you have a uh, you know zoom link and we should do it and that triggered so it, it was really your uh, inputs which triggered our thoughts and we are able to do this thank you very much for that now i'll begin with uh, my brief introduction of the department but as i said here this is a course or this is an area which is not our major thrust area of research per se but this is something that we want should be coming up uh, very well so uh, i will begin now now if we look at our department and vision and mission uh, we know that we aim to create world class committed public health dietetics nutrition and food science professionals and the webinars have already testified that we have been successful in our mission as well as in our mission because we consistently update our curriculum and try to remain abreast with the newer knowledge newer uh, you know uh, newer initiatives that come in our uh, courses carry this along next please now i just want to give a very brief idea of why food service management is so important so if we look at the situation of the people who die you know or they dallies which are the economic indicators that is disability adjusted life years that people live with if they have some kind of disability how many years that they live in so that will have a hamper the productivity of the home as well as the families and if we look at it child and maternal malnutrition tops it and uh, you know then is an air pollution in india and dietary risk if we look at the three top factors two two of the factors are very much related to diets and nutrition and unhealthy diets are the major reason for this uh, the huge burden of emerging problems of non communicable diseases that we are seeing along with obesity okay next please so as i we as we all said we all eat food industry Uh, you know is something which we which is uh, now uh, our largest service sector industry in the country after retail and insurance and it is 20 times higher than the film industry or five times higher than the hotel industry and 1.5 times higher than the pharmaceutical industry so it's a huge industry it's a huge potential for uh, for our students to be working in the right direction Similarly, India's economy is also set set to grow. This is a data of 2019. After COVID, we may have slowed down a bit, but I'm sure we will bounce back. We will come back. So our economy will grow, grow, and in that, you know, in the GDP that we are rising, India food services or food food uh, service is going to play a major role. Food service sector has grown in India many times. Uh, you know, from 2015 to 2018. and has a huge uh, you know estimated huge money of uh, contribution to the gdp of the country therefore this is an industry where uh, as i said it going to be opening lot of opportunities for our students next week so if you look at the growth of the projections that we have the market size has you if you look at it keeps on increasing and the unorganized sector you know not the hotel industry but the people who who do catering you know at home dabba wala or the ladies who are doing uh, catering for schools for children for all those places that is very huge sector and that is where we really want to strike 
because all the people who are working in the in this sector if they understand catering as well as nutrition then i think we'll do a very good job of reducing the dietary risk factors that we are all facing next please so so what are the salient features of food industry we have a emergence of valuable mid mid market food service segments such as casual dining fast casual affordable international cuisine we have home deliveries which are coming in a very big way even during the covid times after a certain time they had opened up home deliveries so that's a big opportunity with many full service and quick service restaurants establishing outlets exclusively for this we have franchising outlets which are expected to become the more preferred mode of expansion young generation has become the driver of growth young they don't want to eat home they want to eat out and fast food outlets target them through innovative marketing strategies value added technology services can facilitate continuous improvement and can maintain food products fresh for a long longer period of time and we also have to do localization of menu we have to modify international cuisine to our taste as well okay so next please so uh, we have been talking about our operating philosophy and i must admit that this operating philosophy did not exist in our department we have just kind of made it because we thought this is an area which requires focus and requires that we must work to strengthen this uh, in our department as well so as we have this four pillar on which our research and our work in the department works so we also have the same pillars like system strengthening capacity building evidence generation partnership building and convergence we also have now food uh, fssai which looks at lot of these issues so this is a system that we have in place in india now couple of years back it started so we need to support the food and safety standard authority of india that is fssai food safety for food safety quality control food labeling and identifying the recommendation gap guideline gap that fssai may have and advocate for changes for them we also would like to conduct training programs for as i said people who work in a, a not very formal kind of segments so those people require a lot of training for entrepreneurship for food safety etc we will we this the another segment that is very important Uh, for us in the department which we have been doing is making functional foods that is a functional ingredients these are the foods which are health benefits so we want to kind of scale up these functional foods see the, the acceptability trial through our institution management quantity cookery laboratories and see whether the children or our, or you know class you know, most of the youngsters are they able to consume them take them and how popular they will be and then we also always as usual always would like to work with partners because we don't believe in working alone so foster partnerships with food service organizations nutritional industries hospitals schools old age homes etc next please so with these things in our mind we have planned this post graduate diploma in food service management we have started in 2015 but as i have already admitted we haven't really taken it off very well and we would want that people should at least those who are listening to it they should understand that this is a very very emerging area where there are lots and lots of entrepreneurs uh, you know uh, opportunities which are available for you jobs may also be available but i believe that we should be job givers as the prime minister has always been saying than job takers and this course gives you this opportunity so the, we are here again we want to have trained cadre of food service professionals equipped with the knowledge of planning preparing set and serving of healthy and nutritious diets in various settings such as hostel mess canteens workplaces industrial kitchens hospitals old age homes blending the skills of producing tasty yet healthy foods for regular eating here we want to be little different from hotel management industry because there although they may say that they look into nutrition but nutrition actually takes a back seat then we also want students to pursue challenging career careers as food service managers or entrepreneurs for dynamic and growth health for the dynamic and growth growing healthcare and food industry 
we want to mainstream nutrition in catering business. That is the major, major objective that we have. That all those who do catering regularly on regular basis should be looking at the nutritional value of food because people are going to eat it day in and day out. Provide excellence and optimization of a food and nutrition service establishments. Provide alternative healthy options. And these students of food service management can gain practical experience and internships in various food establishments. We do intend to place them in various places. Impart skills to be job ready. Now this is a course which is really, we say that skill oriented and makes the student job ready for to move into management administrative uh, in the area of the food and nutrition service sector and move on to become nutri and entrepreneurs to provide nutrition and healthy meals in educational institution, workplaces, old age, etc. So this is all what I have to say. The last, last slide please, is a glimpse of our students who work in our institution management laboratory. We as a part of our dietetics program have a course on institution management, one course only, but we, we want to have a dedicated one year diploma course in food service management so that they can really get the management as well as the planning, culinary skills to really be job ready. Thank you so much. And I welcome all the panelists to our show. I'm really proud of all of you. You've really done well. And thank you, our Dean Man, our Vice Chancellor, and the, all the administrative uh, staff, as well as my behind the work team. And special thanks to Professor Manisha Swati for being you know, so entrepreneurial and coming out with such good, uh, you know, uh, webinar, webinar topics and arranging this for us. Thank you so much, everyone. Over to you, Swati. Thank you very much, very madam, much madam, for giving, for an, giving overview an overview of our webinar. webinar. I think now, I think now we will begin, begin with our with presentations our because we have participants, we have participants who are eagerly waiting from all from across, across India, India not only india but yeah, we have, we participants, have participants who have registered, have registered from, from south sudan, sudan uae, UAE pakistan, pakistan uh, and, other and other countries, other countries as well so, so I, would I would now basically like to introduce, like to introduce our first speaker dr swati Pilavia, who has been our alumni in the 1980s now, Dr. Ilavia graduated, graduated from, from here. here. Then she moved, she moved on to on the US, where she pursued her doctorate doctor degree. And currently, she is the, she president, is the president and co founder of Monsoon Kitchens, which is basically a purveyor of fine Indian foods for food service and retail markets in the United States of America. Prior to this, she has been on a position of a senior as a senior research nutritionist in the general meals in Minneapolis. In addition to this, she is also an active member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and the National Association of College and University Food Service and many more associations as well. Also, she is certified in weight management amongst children and adolescents. And she is also a recipient of many awards and accolades. Like, for example, I'll state a few of them, Heroes in Action, which was awarded to her by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics in 2017. And in addition to this, she has also received uh, accolades like Small Business Person of the Year Award, and also nominated for the Women of the Year 2020 Award by the New England India News in Boston, USA. So over to you, Madam, for the presentation, which our participants are eagerly waiting. Thank you very much, Swati. Can you guys hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You can share yes. your screen, Madam. Yes, I can. Okay. All right. Good morning, good evening, and thank you to uh, Dr. Karolia, Dr. Swati Dhruv, uh, Dr. Mehan, and of course, Dr. Um, uh, Nambia. I, I hope I'm saying it correctly. 
and thank you to the uh, Alumni Association of the Department of Foods and Nutrition for spending your Saturday evening with us. I know it is a, it's a weekend and people need to be doing some things. And I'm also very, very happy to joining the distinguished uh, panelists who are going to be speaking after me. I think I'm one of the oldest alumni in this entire series of webinars. And I thank you all to probably for this series, keeping the best for last, because I think you'll have a lot of fun listening to the stories of uh, how my journey has been and the younger entrepreneurs who are going to come uh, right after me. So thank you very much. And uh, I have to tell you that the whole thing became so relevant to me about what we are talking today, because I was in India in December and January, and whenever I go to Baroda, which happens to be my uh, husband's hometown, I always go and visit my friends because both uh, Dr. Karolia and Dr. Mehan were my juniors. And I love to go visit and feel so proud when I see them running this phenomenal institution. Um, so I was there and um, I was sitting with Dr. Mehan and there was a young student, um, and I'm going to take the liberty of mentioning her name, uh, Kanchi uh, Baria and she brought me this box of chocolates. And, and she had this incredible passion and she was so proud of her creations. And by the way, the chocolates were so good that when I took it back to my mother-in-law who has a really sweet tooth, I never saw those chocolates again. So congratulations, Kanchi. But that was the first thing, you had the passion. And that's where it all starts. Um, I am not a very big fan of PowerPoints. And uh, the reason is that I was given a book by my husband for Christmas, which said, Death by PowerPoint. And I've done so many PowerPoint presentations in person that when I see people dozing off in the back seats, I just like cringe, you know, it just loses my complete concentration. But here, the good thing is I can't see anybody. So I'm assuming that you are all awake and you are all listening to it. Uh, my journey has been very interesting. I have not just landed into food business. When I finished my BSc and MSc at MSU, which was probably one of the finest and the most fun times of my life, um, I came to the US and then I did my PhD in nutrition. My work experience has been very interesting. I worked in a nursing home uh, in the capacity of a clinical dietitian. Then I moved to a supplemental uh, like I, I moved to the community nutritionist program and worked at the largest supplemental feeding program for women and infant uh, and children, which is called the WIC program. And then my husband would always move. He would move like, you know how some people just can't stay in one place. So he would move. And with him, like a good wife, I would move and take our entire entourage. So we moved and I landed up in Minneapolis and I got a job at General Mills and that was as a corporate nutrition uh, nutritionist and I worked in in the research department and I learned an immense amount because General Mills as you all know probably because General Mills is also set up a big research department in Mumbai and a lot of nutritionists are hired for that and it has a huge portfolio of uh, products it has cereals it has yogurt it has meats it has uh, baking mixes, and it has cookbooks, which are under the Betty Crocker one. So I got a tremendous amount of experience. And then, of course, when I was really happy and settled at General Mills, my husband moved again, and we landed in Boston. And of course, there was no place like General Mills at Boston. So I said, you know what, I'm going to start my own business. And I remember one of our friends during our farewell gave a book to my husband saying, so your wife wants to start a business. Well, of course. I wanted to start a business, very supporting husband. And then I said, okay, what am I going to do? I'm a fairly decent cook, but I'm not a chef. So restaurant is not something that I was going to do. So there is a big why. And, and people say, well, what's your business plan? And I'm saying, well, I don't really have a business plan because I hadn't really given much thought to it. So I, I get asked this, what's your business plan in the beginning? But I always believe that one has to know the business essentials before you actually know the business plan. So I have all uh, business essentials on the left in this little balls around the big ball. But my 
my why was very important. Why do I want to start that? And one of it was that I had this vision that I wanted to have Indian food popularized in India, in America. And the reason was that when I was doing my PhD, we had a very young daughter and I, we had very little money also at that time. Um, so I would freeze the food on the weekends so that we could have good meals during the week. And uh, I get to, got to a realization at that time, not knowing that this is what I would end up doing in my, in my future, I realized that the Indian food froze beautifully. The rice froze beautifully, the, the curries froze beautifully, and I think we have enough salt that it really does very well. It freezes well and it returns very well. And so that was, at least I guess the seed was there for me to start building my thoughts on. And then when I would be doing my um, drive, which was 40 miles from where my home was, I would stop at a McDonald's. Now, none of you need to cringe because at that time I didn't know how, how McDonald's was going to become the enemy of everybody. But I would stop by because every time I would get a great grade, which was not very often, um, I would stop by and treat myself to a cheeseburger and a milkshake and a French fries. And no matter where I stop, it was the same taste, exactly the same taste. And I'm saying, how can that happen? So I would of course read a lot about consistencies and standardizations. And I have to hand it to McDonald's. And of course, now the technology has become so much better. That consistency became my mantra. That became my religion. I became so focused about consistency that that was something that I wanted to bring to the foods in India. Because every time you go to an Indian restaurant, one day the chef is in good mood, the food is great. One day the chef is not in good mood, the food is bad. And that's where the consistency was lacking. And of course, you have to have the passion. But what was my passion? My passion was not Thai food or Mexican food. My passion was Indian food. So all together, it came to a point where it was like, okay, I'm going to do Indian foods business. All right, so now what do I do? Am I going to be a Sam Barot and start a food service management company? No, I don't have any such understanding. It's a very capital intensive business. So I wanted to do consumer packaged goods because that's where my background was. I had worked at General Mills, a big consumer package company. Then my husband would say, well, how are you going to scale the business? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how to scale the business. What does that even mean? And uh, so I was really naive. I was very naive when I was starting. And that's why it is very lonely when you start the business. And that's why all these business essentials are very, very critical. Of course, I had uh, skills and knowledge in the field of consumer package. So I'm going to go through a, a lot of different business essentials quickly, but these are the business essentials that Kanchi has to start thinking about because Kanchi has the passion. Her, her chocolates were wonderful. And when I asked her, where are you in the stages of business development? So it's not just having a plan to have business, but how are you going to build it? because that's where the success is. That's where it becomes fun. Because in the beginning, it's like, okay, you have the passion, but then if it doesn't become big enough, you get tired and it's not successful and you feel defeated. Um, so Kanchi said to me, she's just in the process of actually registering the trademark. And then I said, do you know your competitors? And she didn't have a whole lot of idea about it. So Kanchi, this is to you. Um, you need to know who your customer is. And for us, it was big thing. And these are going to be all not in a sequence because when you are starting the business, nothing is in sequence. It's only for established companies that things happen in a sequence. And I think all of my co-panelists would agree with me that you are alone. You have to manage a lot of juggling balls and you have to do it simultaneously because that's what you are supposed to do when you are putting 17 hours days. So don't think that this is an eight hour day job. You are going to be super busy. You are going to learn to, to sleep less and all kinds of things. So for me, it was very clear. We didn't have a lot of money. We didn't want to go into the retail which requires packaging and branding and all kinds of things. And food service was the one which Dr. Mehan talked about food service management. When I was at Hansamata Hall, even there when the 
the chef is going to be buying products, he's going to buy some products that are in bulk because he's going to make it, whether it is dairy, whether it is oil, whether it is produce, all kinds of different packaged foods, but they come into big wholesale uh, um, packages and they are cheaper because you don't have to do a big packaging development. So we decided that we were going to food service. Of course, product development is a big thing. What kind of a product do you want to be? Do you want to be in a, in, in a fresh product? Do you want to be in a shelf-stable product? What's the standard of identity for you? Are you want, interested in dairy product? Are you interested in grains? Are you interested in chicken? Are you interested in vegetables, lentils? Whatever is your passion is going to define what kind of a product type is and also what your customer is demanding. So the standard of identity for me, of course, I used to freeze fruits and that's what I knew. Even though General Mills had a lot of other kinds of uh, uh, standard of identities, I always gravitated to frozen foods. And then is this production friendly? So yes, I can make you know two, three cups of product in my, in my kitchen, but then when we start to make 300 pounds, 1,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds curry sauce, is it going to be production friendly? And that's something that we had to learn. How are you going to develop your brand? Uh, brand positioning. How are you going to sell Indian food in America where the first question that's being asked of you is, is there curry in it? I'm like, oh, good God. I have to now go to Curry 101 education for people. Even today I get asked, is there curry in it? And I'm saying, well, you know what? In India, there is really no such thing as curry powder that we put in our food and call it a curry. Curry means gravy. So a lot of education had to be done. Um, what's your story? Everybody loves a story. And I am so looking forward to hearing the stories of Manoj and uh, the other two panelists who are coming. How are you going to package your product? Is the package going to tell your story? Well, my package wasn't going to tell the story because it was a food service package. So it's just a big, ugly box with the product in there and there is no story over there. What's your competition? Who is my uh, competition in food service? And we realized that at that time, we didn't have a lot of competition in food service for food business but I was wrong. Uh, that's what I thought, but I was wrong. What kind of a manufacturing I'm going to do? Am I going to make it in a rented kitchen? Am I going to set up my own commissary? Or am I going to go and look for a, a manufacturing partner, which is like an outsourced partner? There are challenges to starting your own. Huge problem with labor. Huge problem with overhead. So if you do not have a uh, product, I mean, customers for two or three months, you are still paying rent and you are paying for the utilities and you're paying your employees. And then the whole big regulatory, I think not only in America, but even across the world, the regulatory environment is becoming stricter and stricter because just by seeing COVID, it all started with food. So the regulations are going to be becoming even worse for the food industry and we have to be prepared for it. What is the legal portion of it? Labeling, what are you going to label? As yesterday we heard fabulous uh, presentations saying there is claims to be made. You have to have a nutrition label. I had a lot of experience in nutrition labeling because that's one of the jobs that I did at General Mills. And then of course, all kinds of safety of it. And if you start your own manufacturing facility, you have to deal with all of this. But we still started with our own facility. And then we have the pricing model. Can you have enough gross margin so that you can pay for everything else? Do you have food service and retail understanding of whether larger boxes are cheaper to make versus the smaller boxes with beautiful packaging with a bow on top? Are there hidden costs to it? What is your cost for marketing? Do you need brokers? Are you going to hire your own people? Do you have contracts that are going to give you fixed amounts of sales? All of these things had to be done at the same time when I was developing products. So the product gets developed based on what's your gross margin requirement and what kind of a standard of identity it is, is because are you doing food service? Is your, is your distribution, which is the next one, supply chain? What is the most expensive supply chain? Is it, is it easier to ship a shelf stable product versus the refrigerated product versus the frozen product. Who is going to be a logistical chain? And if you are doing it locally, 
So suppose if you started, if Kanchi started the business in Baroda uh, and, and said, okay, I'm going to just sell in all the stores in Baroda, there is a certain kind of logistics. If she said, I'm going to sell to all of Gujarat, different kind of logistics. Now she wants to go to Maharashtra. Now she wants to go to Bangalore. I would love to see Kanchi's chocolates on all shelves in all the stores in India. She has a huge challenge of supply chain. What is the cost? Who is her logistical partner? All of these things have to be thought through because that determines the beginning because you really need to then pivot if it doesn't work for you, you pivot quickly and say, okay, I was wrong. I need to walk away from this. I need to start. So be agile, be flexible, and be able to say, okay, this didn't work. I'm going without having a heartache. Because if you stay with your passion, which is very, very important, but if it is not pragmatic to actually get to the customer, you are never going to be successful. A lot of customer education is required in marketing. I mean, these days, marketing is very different than when I started. There is Facebook, there is Instagram, and I think a lot of you can probably see our Instagram posts. You should go on our Facebook, you should go uh, on our LinkedIn, and you should also go uh, on our website. And there is social media, good and bad. I mean, you can have a really one bad social media post and you have a lot of damage control to do. But the customer education in traditional markets, who wants to buy samosa? Oh, we really don't. We have egg rolls. We have Chinese egg rolls and we are not interested in samosa. So there were just a lot of challenges in the beginning. But the fact is, if you develop your strategy by learning where you are not resonating, you will be successful. Network. It is lonely. It is very lonely to start a business because you are doing everything. So have a network, 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 network. Make sure that you connect with people, you ask questions, there is no bad questions, there's no stupid question. And then of course, how are you going to have the customers? You can have one customer and you want to, the, to go to the second, the third, and then of course the thousandth customer, but you still want to have your first customer. So what is the cost of acquiring new customers and keeping the old customers. So, so that is also a science in itself. And then the customer service, how are you going to be able to continue to do customer service so your previous, your first customers don't leave you? Hiring and training. Do you have the understanding of how to hire people, how to train them? And then when they get trained, do you have the bandwidth to keep them with you? Are you paying them well? Are you giving them the opportunity to grow in the business? And then of course, the biggest thing, the last but the biggest thing is capital. Are you going to use a personal savings? Are you going to borrow from friends and family? Are you going to the, go to the bank? There is no bank that's going to give it to you unless you, you, you know, give your um, right arm to them. Are there professional investors? The beauty is now that food business is actually gaining some uh, popularity amongst the professional investors. Um, I don't have professional investors, but among the professional investors, there can be angel investors and I have angel investors who are basically friends and family. And then there are the private equity firms and the venture capitals. And they are truly, they, they, they give you a lot of resources, but they also own you. So you have to decide what your comfort level is. How long is your road going to be? Do you want it to all come together in five years or do you want it to come in 15 years? Is it a lifestyle? And then of course there is the work-life balance because you're going to work long hours. You are going to have sleepless nights and you are going to have reflection. What did I do wrong? Is, is, the, is the commissary working? Is somebody buying my product and does not have a sponge like we had once in one of our dolls, a cleaning sponge was found by a customer. I mean, it just caused me two weeks of just damage control. So, so these are some of the, these are some of the, um, um, and I'm going to actually uh, go back to the storytelling for me. Um, and then I'll tell you my successes. So I have to tell you stories now because that's exactly what I love to do. So when I started to think about what was my business going to be, it was supposed to be uh, frozen food, which I already talked to you about. 
and we went into the, um, uh, let me show you something else in interesting. Okay, so here I'm going to show you, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. If you see this uh, brown box, which is a, a big box, there's a four pound bag of a sauce and that goes to the hotels, colleges, hospitals. Uh, here is a big, big uh, um, uh, let's see, two. here is a big uh, samosa um, packet which has about 80 samosas. Now, a family, a consumer is not going to buy it, but it has no packaging. It has absolutely no beautiful uh, brand on that or a colorful uh, graphics. So these are the ones that we started with, which was supposed to be um, for food service. And our food service customers are uh, military, uh, high schools, colleges, corporate cafeterias, hospitals, caterers, recreational places, uh, cruise lines, casinos, and you name it. So anybody who wants to buy the product, we sell it to them. And I think that has been a phenomenal success for us because we stayed with food service for much longer than anybody else stayed. Um, and we, we developed a, a very big following for it. We have a very, very good customer base and now we are national. And what we did was we decided to hire um, brokers instead of hiring our own salespeople right in the beginning. The brokers, you give them 5%, you give them a certain retainer, but you don't have your own employees that are going to be doing your um, selling because that becomes a fixed cost for you. So that was a very big thing, which of course, unfortunately due to COVID, since everything is closed, that business has gone down to seed, which, which kind of has, has stressed me out so much, but at the same time, some good things happen. And we started with our uh, food uh, retail products. And if you see, uh, the retail products, there's this beautiful packages, if you can see. A um, lot of expense go went into it. We have three different kinds of samosas. We have rice bowls. Uh, we have some incredible technology that we are using for fresh meals, which are high pressure pasteurization meals. So, so it all is possible just now to do it. Um, but my beginning was really uh, not very smooth. And, and I can tell you that. Uh, I'm going to go back to the uh, previous slides so that way I can show you um, where exactly how it all happened. So very quickly, I went to one customer because I had thought, oh my God, I have these beautiful spice blends. I'm going to go ahead and show it to my customer. So I went to, I, I, I went to my customer and that was the chef at Harvard University because I was in Boston. There are 14 cafeterias and I took, him, took it to him and I said, Chef Martin, I have this beautiful spice blends. I have a tandoori masala, I have a curry masala, I have a vegetable masala, I have a dal masala, I have a kebab masala. And he looked at me, he said, you know Swati, we are already buying the pastes, which are the tandoori paste, and then we are going to make, we, we, we ship it to our 14 cafeterias. And then he brought me a bag of a sauce. And he said, look, we already buy the paste. We were shipping it to our 14 cafeterias and every chef was making a different tasting uh, product. So every, uh, every chef was making a different tikka masala sauce. So they took it all away from the chefs and they brought it to their central commissary. They used the paste, made a sauce and then shipped it out. A lot of work, a lot of logistics, extra added cost. So he told me, if you can bring me a fully finished sauce that we just have to add the chicken or the vegetables or the fish to, you got my business. Six months later, I was there with sauces and I still have Harvard as one of my biggest college accounts. So the tenacity, the, the ability to pivot and forget about the spice blend was very critical for me at that time. And, uh, uh, um, so after, after that, but, but during those six months, I actually worked with a lot of different chefs um, uh, to create a product that would work. I, I partnered with a restaurant owner and then we added our own commissary. So even when, when we are talking about, say, the manufacturing part of it. So if you look at this manufacturing one, we started our own commissary, but it was a 3000 square feet commissary and we 
had uh, um, uh, that the workers who were working, employees were working, making samosas and pakoras. We did buy a samosa machine. So the samosas were coming out the same size every time. But there was a gentleman who was dropping the pakoras and in the morning, his, he had energy, so the pakoras were nice and small and consistent size. But by the afternoon, his hand would hurt, so the pakoras were coming bigger. And of course, that just changes the entire consistency model that you have been uh, promoting. So, so we started that, but in 2012, we decided to shut down our own manufacturing and went to a co-packing facility, and that increased our uh, capabilities. Uh, we, we could do a lot of different uh, types of things and it also increased our uh, margins because we didn't have any overhead because those manufacturing facilities are constantly making many many different products so they don't they have a much lower overhead and uh, so manufacturing was one thing that really helped us get to uh, where we are today if we had stayed in a 3000 uh, square feet facility i don't think that i would have ever been able to um, introduce the retail products. And uh, just now we are working with three different manufacturing facilities and looking for a fourth one. Scaling of the business was a very big thing and that goes with selling. So the validation of your product and the validation that this product is viable is in selling. And if you don't, it, if you don't make a sale, there is something wrong with it. So you need to understand what is going on. Is it the taste? Is it the pricing? Is it your supply chain because you can't get to people? Is it that your employees are not doing the right job of selling it? So for me personally, if I would go to a customer and I think if I went to Sam today and if Sam were not Indian and Sam were, were an American gentleman and I said, um, I have this fabulous tikka masala sauce and you need to serve chicken tikka masala to your customers, Sam would say, well, you can do it, but my American chefs are not going to be able to do it. And um, um, I had to hire local people and I had to train them. And I had to make sure that I started to sell only the top selling products because I can say, I want to sell 20 products. So just now we have 40 products, but I can tell you only top 10 products sell 80% of our revenue. 80% of our revenue comes from our top 20 products. So you still want to have a program, you still want to have a portfolio, but be prepared and not have a heart attack that not everything is going to sell. Um, legal, I always had consultants for labeling, I had consultants because even though I understood it, we are not big enough to have our own uh, legal counsel. I don't have uh, a need to have somebody in labeling all the time. Like uh, yesterday, Dr. Daniel was uh, a, a full-time uh, regulatory person at Bush Brothers. And uh, we had a regulatory department in nutrition at General Mills, but do I need one? Probably not. So I have a fantastic consultant who I work with. So, so learn to develop your network of consultants, of the legal people, the accounting people, and then of course the broker network and then the distributors. Uh, so a lot of things have to happen. And now we are at that stage where when we want to launch a product, it happens sequentially. Now I'm not balancing a lot of balls in the air at one time. Um, I'm going to now go to the last slide quickly for you, and it might be a little bit of a hodgepodge, but I like to weave in the stories. Uh, our biggest successes have been the national distribution. If we didn't get the national distribution, it just is not a good enough scale for us. For Kanchi, for the chocolates to be a success, she will need to start locally, go to the state level, and then go for 10 states, and then 12 states, and then go to the national level. Um, we have the maximum number of food service contracts of any other Indian company. And I'll let Sam manage, uh, uh, tell you all about it, but there are large food service management companies such as Sodexo and Aeromark. And I know Sodexo is in India, and I do know they are hiring a lot of nutritionists and the registered dietitians. 
Uh, so Sodexo manages a lot of big corporate cafeterias in India, such as Google and uh, uh, Morgan Stanley and all of these big multinationals that are moving to India. We have a national food service broker, which is not very often seen for a small company like that. Now, is that because we are a phenomenal company or is it because our products get them uh, into the bigger accounts because we have vegan products and just now vegan is bigger than anything else. Our brokers go in and say, hey guys, we have a vegan product, come on in. You can come in, show them the vegan products and then they can show all the other portfolios. We had a very successful retail launch literally a year ago and we had the biggest retail launch for the fresh product two weeks before COVID hit. And I can't tell you that has been the life savior for us. Uh, we were, as I said, the first one to, to do this innovative fresh products. And you might cringe, but this is an incredible technology. And if it is fresh product, like a chicken tikka masala with rice, it literally has 120 days of shelf life. And then of course, I got the SBA award and then the American of Nutrition and Dietetics also recognized for people uh, who are excellent in their chosen field. So I was one of them in the food and nutrition business, but of course there were others in clinical nutrition and all the others. When you are looking for a job or to start your own business, there is a lot of opportunity in India. And I think that's why this webinar is for, not as to what my success is, but as to how you can get to be successful. In US, there are a lot of jobs, as you heard yesterday, in labeling, regulatory compliance, product development, sales, and even culinary. But in India, I have shared this link, which was sent to me by a very dear friend in Mumbai. And this is a very big uh, uh, report. It's like 47 pages. I think you all should read it if you are interested in food business. It talks about uh, food service management, as Dr. Mehan said, as to what the opportunities are. And it also talks about what's happening in the consumer packaged goods. Very similar opportunities in India because there is the economy is doing so well. People are looking for healthy foods. People are looking for convenience. And I think that the role of Department of Nutrition is to train our students. I feel that with my conversation with Dr. Mehan, um, it would be so good to reach out to one of the big or local food companies and have them support open a center for entrepreneurship in food and nutrition. I, th I think that is important. I would love to get involved in that because I have seen how some of the companies in India, especially the case study I read just now of a company called ID out of Bangalore, which is just taken India by storm. They started with making dosa mixes and they got their funding from uh, Azim Premji. So I know that they have their own uh, incubation uh, funding groups over there. I know that Piramals are doing a lot of funding. Um, I have worked with Haldiram uh, in India and I have worked with Surya Foods in um, Baroda and they all are fantastic uh, places in terms of food and beverage development or to support the food and beverage entrepreneurship. Um, so I think we can do some of the other uh, conversations during Q&A because I think I've taken a lot of time and I appreciate your patience. Uh, thank you very much. There's just a lot to talk about and um, thank you so much and good luck to my next panelists. Thank you very much, Dr. Swami.